So let's get started. So um, what you can't see over here, because we've got these, oh, there it is. Um, WebRTC, the future of communications. The reason I put a question mark on it is because a lot of people don't even know what WebRTC is, so how could it be communications? Um, you know, if you think about how we've been communicating as broadcasters, we've pretty much been depending on RF links mm -hmm. and the public telephone or the public switch telephone network for a long time. And so if we hit the little, is this a clicker? Uh, no, that's for the projector. Oh, you just point at me and then. Uh... Oh, there we go. So what I've done is I've created a very brief timeline of telecommunications, um, at least from the Comrex perspective. Um, and it's really kind of like this, somewhere between Alexander Graham Bell and Al Gore, we depended on circuit switch data services for things like the public switch telephone network. And I mean, even way back into the seventies, we had some 26 megahertz queuing systems that basically if you had a 26 meg license, you could actually use our LPQRA CTA stuff. Um, telephone frequency extenders, some of you probably have some of those in shops, um, holding up in open doors or um, collecting dust on a shelf somewhere. If you have a three line frequency extender, I don't want it. I've got did one. you guys make one? Yeah. Oh. Yes, we did. I used Gettner's. I don't think I used yours. Yeah. Um, you know, the, our two line frequency extenders were really good. Um, the three lines were just a little bit tweaky. It was just that third line trying to get it dialed in. You get some phasing in the upper ends and stuff. But, so cool. but we did a lot of stuff with the public switch telephone network. And then, of course, when Al Gore invented the internet, everything changed. Well, uh, he didn't invent the internet. No, he supported a lot of legislation that basically provided the framework. And you know, one of his staffers coined the phrase information superhighway, blah, blah, blah. But between here and here, we came up with uh, a line of products that depended on public internet, which when I started with Comrex about 2004, they said that they were gonna create an IP audio codec that used the public internet. I actually started to get my resume ready because I didn't think it was gonna work. But somehow they managed to find a way to leverage what has now become the most widely deployed telecommunications infrastructure on the planet to deliver high quality audio and now video over the public internet. Things really, really changed in 2010 with the development of WebRTC. Just out of curiosity, who knows what WebRTC is? Crazy. Okay, so let's go to our next slide. Go on. My my clicker is not working. Okay. Yeah. So to point two, at him. Okay, there we go. I have to do this. <laughs> um, in 2010, Google, Google, the evil Google empire. Bought um, global IP solutions um, and this technology that they were developing, which they then presented to the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force and the World Wide Web Consortium, and they released it as an open source project um, with this name of WebRTC, which stands for Web Real Time Communication. So the whole concept is you've got this suite of tools that is built in to common web browsers. And Google actually took that and put it in to their Chrome browser. Essentially, and we'll get into the details, it is an audio coding algorithm, a video coding algorithm, and an interactive text engine, uh, and some other stuff. Ericsson Labs actually implemented something called a Bowser, I don't know why, because they're Swedish and they come up with weird names for stuff. Um, and they were actually able to make a uh, browser to browser voice call with it in 2013. And then, or I'm sorry, 2011, 2013, they actually started to use the video engine to make the first browser to browser video call. Now, if you think about it, it's not that long ago that all this stuff started to happen. And so the first data to data or browser to browser data transfer took place in 2014. Kind of crazy to think that instead of having a piece of hardware on each side or a VoIP phone on each side or a computer on each side, you're using a web browser and the engines in the web browser 
to do video transfer, voice transfer, data transfer. So um, in 2014, Google came out with a platform called Hangouts, which they just changed again to something called Chats, which are in some other reasons, but it's something that I use to communicate with our people in the office. Um, and back then, it used to do video and audio and text. So about 2017, actually a little bit before that, we started well, between 2014 and 2017, I got dragged to a bunch of really boring conferences with a bunch of uh, engineering eggheads, I mean, our engineering uh, staff, to learn about WebRTC and how we can basically make some tools for broadcasters. Because at the time, browser to browser is great if you're sitting on a computer. But what if you want to create a tool that you can give to a broadcaster that has a broadcast facing interface? So we started to work on something and we introduced a product called Opal, which is a box, which acts as a WebRTC server, sits in the studio. You send a link to someone, they click on it, they hit connect, and they're sending high quality audio, 20 hertz to 22 kilohertz, using the Opus algorithm, which is built into the web browser, to do two way audio. Kind of mind blowing that you actually now, in a computer or a smartphone, have a high quality, low latency audio codec. And if you think about it, these things are filled with high quality audio and video algorithms already. Uh, you've got AMR wideband, you've got EVS, which is a new algorithm, you've got uh, H.264 for video, um, sometimes H.265, you've got a whole suite of AAC algorithms already in these devices. And now you have this Opus coding algorithm built into uh, the web browser and also H.264. So we actually had a first stable release in 2018. And the crazy thing is, it's not just in Chrome, you have this consortium of major manufacturers or tech giants that have actually gotten together to put it in all their browsers. So you're gonna find it in Opera, you're gonna find it in Mozilla's Firefox, uh, the parent company Zyph is actually the, um, the, person that's, or the group that's leading this consortium. Uh, Microsoft Edge has it, even in Apple's Safari browser. So in all of these major browsers and even some minor browsers like Puffin and Vivaldi and a few others, um, they have the Opus coding algorithm, H.264, EP8 also, G.722, and um, some very sophisticated algorithms that are controlling things like dynamic buffering, encoder throttling, some really rudimentary forms of error protection and concealment. Okay, so here are the basics. Um, you have an audio engine, which has those algorithms that we talked about. You have a video engine with VP8, H.264. And then you have the data engine, which is used primarily for text messaging back and forth and actually data and whatnot. So here's what happens. When you're using WebRTC, um, you're clicking on something on a web page and it wakes up a little, basically wakes up a little line of JavaScript that selects the engine that you're gonna use. So you click on a button, JavaScript says, I wanna use voice. And then it uses stun, simple traversal under utilities for networks. And it's actually gonna start checking what's going on on the firewall and on the net. It's doing some communication. It's going to find the browser on the other end that it wants to communicate with. Um, and it's doing it by means of an intermediary uh, server. It's going to do a secure, uh, an SSL certificate exchange to make sure that it's a secure exchange. And then it asks for permission on the requester to use the camera or the microphone on the device. And that could be, again, on a smartphone, be on a PC. And then it creates a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the two browsers. So essentially, you have this little triangle of stuff going on. You have this um, intermediary uh, server in the middle. Browser talks to here. It sends a message to the receiver. It talks to the server. They do a certificate exchange, and then they do a peer-to-peer -peer connection between the two. That server actually will just kind of ping and kind of manage the, the flow 
in the interim while the call's going on. So one of the things that I can point to as a really simple version of WebRTC is something that I put on the Comrex webpage. So if you go to Comrex.com, there's this little icon that will appear in the lower right-hand corner. It's a telephone. If you click on it, that line of JavaScript wakes up a little engine and it opens up this window and it gives you the option to make a call, a voice call or a video call to any of these people that are standing by to talk to you. So in, in my office at home, I have my computer open. I have this little app sitting on my desktop. All of a sudden it'll start to ring because someone has clicked the, the call or the video. I click on it. All that exchange is taking place between the intermediary server and the other web browser. And then once that call is established, we're talking in beautiful 20 hertz to 22 kilohertz audio or H.264 video. It's crazy that you're using a web browser. You're not using some kind of giant hardware server. You're not using a 5 ESS switch or an MT1 terminal or any of that fun stuff, mainly because those are all gone now. Um, and there it is. So if you get a little bit deeper into it, this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. Well, it looks like little bits, you can't see those, but this is kind of the stuff that's going on. So you've got this WebRTC uh, application programming interface. There's a media capture element to it. These are all the layers that are happening. And then this is all the communication that's taking place um, between the stun server, the signaling server in the middle, stun server on the other side. It doesn't look that unlike a VoIP call. It is actually using some elements of, of SIP protocol, which is kind of the root of VoIP polyphony. But there is SIP signaling going on between the two elements along with some SSL stuff. I don't get most of it, it's kind of boring. Okay, so a lot of people are like, when, it, when we talk about WebRTC, they're like, so it's like Skype, right? Well. It's like Skype, but it's nothing like Skype because Skype is owned by the evil Microsoft empire. We don't like Skype. We don't like Microsoft. <clears throat> anyway, we're a Linux house, but um, we have more problems with anybody that works for Microsoft. Because I can kind of dial back the rhetoric. But I, I, I use an awful lot of them. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all do. I, I, mean, I have my headaches. We just don't have a lot of choice. Um, I'm a little bit bitter about Skype because several years ago we have a we had a phone system called uh, Stack VIP, and we thought it'd be really cool to be an appliance that was plugged into Skype because Skype at the time offered a program where you could actually write code, have it approved by the folks in Estonia because that's where it was based out of. So we sent our hardware over there a few times to get it approved, and we we're plugged into Skype so that people could make a Skype call into our phone system. It was actually seamless, worked really, really well. It's all Microsoft bought it. And then we got unplugged from Skype. So all of that time and treasure was just kind of blown up with the phone. And we're just a little guy, so it's frustrating. So Skype is an application. WebRTC is a technology. So it's nothing like Skype because WebRTC is not just an app that you put on a computer, it's actually built in to common web browsers. Um, so you have to download Skype onto a device, whether it's a smartphone or a computer, you have to register it, blah, blah, blah. And as I mentioned, WebRTC is built into common web browsers. What about CleanFeed? CleanFeed is WebRTC. Huh. Cool. Um, as I mentioned, Skype is owned by my good friends up the road. Um, yeah, and WebRTC is open source, which means it's free. There's no licensing. You don't have to buy a, you know, a year subscription or any of that other stuff. <laughs> if you've got the web browser, you've got the communications tool on your device. You have to be registered with Skype. And WebRTC is as simple as a link. Create a link, send it to the guest. They click on it, boom, they're in. So years ago, in the early stage of the stages of this, 
um, Firefox, the web browser, had a link sponsored by Telefonica uh, out of Spain. And you might remember there was, anybody use Firefox? Okay. Do you remember the little link that was on there? It was like, call somebody else. So that was WebRTC in the early, early days. You could uh, click on it. It would create a link, send it to a friend, and it was doing browser-to-browser -browser calls. It's since been removed for whatever reason. I guess Telefonica ran out of money for it. But um, that was early WebRTC, as simple as a link. Where does Zoom figure into this? Zoom is a little bit more complicated um, because Zoom uses some elements of WebRTC, but again, it's a, depending on how you use it, you can use Zoom for web, but that's WebRTC. Zoom um, is an application you put on the computer and it uses some elements of WebRTC. So there are some hybrids like Zoom. Um, Skype is very well engineered. I mean, it's got some really nice algorithms. It uses uh, the Silk algorithm. It uses the Celt algorithm. Um, but it's not really easy to integrate into applications, as we learned in our days with uh, Stack VIP. Now you have to, I don't know, they, they licensed it to New Tech for their uh, Skype TX. But I guess they only believe that a certain level of manufacturer could uh, be responsible enough to handle Microsoft's technology. This is all I got to say. Anyway, so um, WebRTC is relatively easy to integrate. I mean, it, it's very easy to integrate because it's already in the web browser. And think of this, I mean, over 7 billion endpoints that you can communicate with, which is nuts. And um, Skype uses the still coding algorithm, as I mentioned, WebRTC is based on Opus. And Opus is an interesting coding algorithm, um, and we'll get into how interesting it is. Um, well, it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup. It's <laughs> two great tastes taste great together. That being said, it uses the Silk algorithm that is in Skype, and then it uses the Celt algorithm, which was developed by again. Well, it's complicated because there are supposedly some proprietary legal challenges. I think those are gone now. Uh, the reason that I know they're gone was because Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Zeif have all basically jumped into this open source project. Had there been a true legal challenge, um, I would assume that the folks at uh, Google and their giant team of lawyers, their 350,000 lawyers that they have would have squashed it. So it's being used by almost everything these days. Um, so if you look at the Opus coding algorithm, this gives you an idea of how really kind of nice it is and how it fits into the overall scheme of, of um, usability by all of these applications. We've got Opus in all of our IP audio codecs. Um, the nice thing about it is those libraries are um, license free. So we can put it into our codex without having to pay uh, 25 cents per codec or whatever ridiculous amount of money we have to pay. Um, I would have to say that, you know, we really like AAC algorithms. That's why we include those in our devices. Some of the AMR wideband and narrowband stuff that's, that are in cell phones, those have licensing fees. Those are nice. But Opus actually kind of fills the bill across the whole spectrum from low bit rate to high bit rate, from narrow band to full stereo bandwidth. So it's really kind of a nice algorithm to use. And the fact that it's free, it's kind of bonus. This is, oh, so let's talk about all of the things that are using WebRTC right now. And you might not even be aware that you are using WebRTC in some applications. These are some of the browsers that are using it. Edge, Chrome, Safari, Opera, Vivaldi, Brave, Puffin, blah, 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 blah. There are all kinds of mobile operating systems that are using it as well. Um, I think this one doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> um, but there are some other obscure ones, iOS, of course. Um, so there is WebRTC and all of these OSs. There are all of these different, and especially in the age of the pandemic, 
we really learned that online education was a thing for those of you who have kids or grandkids that were at home throughout the whole thing and having to do school. Um, WebRTC became a huge part of online education for like um, online dual uh, communication, telemedicine, gaming, um, all of these uh, speakers, intelligent speakers are using WebRTC as well. Okay. Um, and here we get into some of the other applications that are using it. Facebook Messenger is all built on WebRTC. WhatsApp, another one that's owned by our friends at Meta. Discord, Twitch, uh, Amazon Chime, blah, 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 go to meeting. Um, so BlueJeans is uh, something that Verizon has. That's their WebRTC app. This is just a few. There are hundreds, if not thousands of applications that are actually using WebRTC today. You might have even used it. If you've ever gone to uh, dxengineering.com and you click on the thing to chat with somebody, that's WebRTC. You go to Ham Radio Outlet, there's a little thing that pops up that says, hey, do you wanna chat with somebody right now? That's WebRTC. You go to anything, any website, and a thing pops up and they wanna know if you want to buy something. There are automated things and Web engine, that's all web RTC. Lots. 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 So there are some um, mm -hmm. professional applications like IPDTL, Source Connect Now, Main Feed, um, Live Switch, and some others. Uh, I put QGo Live on there. It's not actually true. Some aspects of what uh, Lee does um, uses web RTC, but our Comrex Opal is a web RTC device. So we're seeing more and more WebRTC appliances that are popping up. And of course, anybody can create one because all you have to do is Google WebRTC developers and you'll find at least 2,000, half of which were in Ukraine. You probably can't get a hold of them now, unfortunately. Um, but there are a lot of applications for it. So what is WebRTC used for? Just about everything. Online, gaming, uh, HR management, social networking, dating services, ah, tech support. You know, we use it for, um, I end up doing tech support, even though it's a marketing tool, for, you know, to answer questions about an access or a brick link or something like that on our website. But it's a great support tool as well. Um, but surveillance and live broadcast, mm -hmm. yada, yada, yada. <laughs> so what is this about? What is my cue up here at the top? Is it what does that say up there? I have no idea what I'm talking about now. Well, how about, can we move this thing to the bottom? I don't know. How good is good enough? Oh, okay. That, that explains it. How good is good enough? Because in the age of the pandemic, you know, 2020, 2021, there was so much bad content that was put on the air um, using WhatsApp or Zoom or Teams or Skype, just real, real horrible audio and horrible video. But how good as professional broadcasters is good enough? And what are some of the things you can do to make it better? Well, first of all, you don't use Zoom even though people want to use it. You definitely don't use Skype ever because of the reasons that I have enumerated the set that. All of these things, I'm, my wife um, is an interpreter and she has to do Microsoft Teams meetings and it just never works out well for a number of different reasons. If you don't mind, look at his my thing. You want me to tell you? <laughs> there it is. Okay. Oh, you have some, some... Well, I sat in on some simply things which use Microsoft Teams and I was having a devil of a time getting to all the stuff that they were trying to pass to me and, and just getting into the meeting. Yeah. So as an audio guy, I'm just irritated by how bad the audio is. Um, if you remember in 2020, I want to say maybe in June, there was a... Uh, 
like a concert with all these uh, music artists all around the world. It was at home together. It was on all the networks. Lady Gaga was the one that threw it together. And I would say it was literally thrown together. Um, and just, I mean, she is a great musician, and but she's not a technician. Um, was watching it. And she was, I guess, at home. And she had this uh, $12,000 Telefunken C11 microphone. <laughs> Um, and she was, you could see the, the stone on the, the walls around her and she was talking and it sounded like she was in the mouth of a cave because she was talking in the notch. She was speaking into the back of the microphone. It's just like, oh, oh, oh. And she was doing it on zoom and there was automatic game control chasing her around. There was, uh, acoustic noise, echo cancellation chasing her around processing was chasing i mean the processing was basically working hard on the video and it didn't really give a crap about the voice because that's what zoom does that's what what's after they all do that so what you can do to make it better is turn some stuff on and off you can turn off agc first of all you can turn off echo cancellation you can make sure that you're not using video or other streaming apps if you want the audio to sound good. Make sure that you have your network set up for uh, audio service or best effort. Prioritize the, the ports of the data channel for the application. Make sure that the interface is super, super simple because like you said, Microsoft Teams, <laughs> um, use dedicated hardware or server, not a computer that's running 14 other applications. Don't put it on your automation system. Don't put it on dedicated hardware. Educate the users as much as possible. Fingers crossed. Um, make sure that people that are using this have realistic expectations because if you're using computer software, it's computer software. If it's Microsoft, you can almost rest assured that just before you go on the air, it's going to want to update and it's gonna slow down your machine. And if you decide to update, it's gonna take you off the air for 15 minutes while it updates or long. Okay, so at a very, very minimum, um, if you want the audio to sound good, you have to make sure that you have a microphone and a pair of headphones. Don't use the computer speaker in an open room. How many times do I hang up on people that call me because they're doing this every time because I don't like being talked to from across the room. I think it's rude. It sounds bad. As an audio guy, offended. Okay. So if you don't mind, okay, that's what we like. We like headphones and a microphone. These ladies over here, they have some good AKG headsets or maybe audio technica. I don't think an AKG. No. What are those? Those might be Sennheisers. Right. Those are HP. Yep. Okay. Um, even this young lady down here has got the right idea. She's got a good USB microphone, pair of headphones. This guy here, earbud. <laughs> um, near Neil Boards used to be on WSB in Atlanta. I used to listen to him all the time. I don't know if he was out this far. Mm -hmm. um, but if anybody ever called on the on their cell phone with earbuds, you would immediately dump them because earbuds sound so bad. So I would suggest the same thing. This guy, these are the guys that call me and want to know if I have property that I want to sell, or if you know, if uh, <laughs> I want to buy a list of you know trade show attendees, and those go away really quickly. So garbage in, garbage out. Best microphone you can get. You know, I have um, I have a headset here that actually is really, really good that you can get on Amazon. Sennheiser, but look at all this cables and cords and whatnot. Sennheiser USB headset. It's a PC thirty six. Yeah, it's a nice headset. Former Sennheiser guy. Here. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, Cost actually makes a nice one for 50 bucks. I think this costs 40 bucks. Mm -hmm. So 
here's my deal. I, I love listening to the radio. I love listening to AM. And who was, oh, Donald Rumsfeld. I was listening to the Sean Hannity show, and I openly admit that, um, driving down the road. And I wanted to hear what Donald Rumsfeld had to say because he was like pitching his book. And I swear to God, you could, it sounded like he was in the back of a limo. Phone was buried in his throat. Got a glass of scotch in one hand. I couldn't understand anything I was saying. I kept on leaning into the dashboard thinking that was going to improve it. <laughs> and it just, it blows my mind that if you're going to be pitching a book or be on a national talk show or be on the air, period, if you care about what's being heard by the listener, take the effort to get a $40 headset and sound good. I couldn't listen to it. I had a, and two people on cell phones yelling at each other on a talk show is not my idea of quality content. Yes, sir. What do you think of the Hue microphone? I think they're great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I don't I don't mean for my ham radios. So here's the funny thing. I used to work for Symmetrics a few years ago. <laughs> um, I had uh, darker hair back. Um, I had people buying 520 ADs and they were asking me, uh, you know, the uh, voice processor strip and they were asking me what microphones to buy. And I was like, I don't know, a AKG TL, TL2, you know, 414 TL2. They were buying those because they wanted to sound great on 17 meters. It's amazing. Well, of course, you know, they want to sound like boss jocks on 17 meters. Why not? And there are doctors and lawyers and retired engineers that are buying lots of really expensive gear to sound really good on ham radio. Why not? I, and, and Heil is actually a really good price for... Uh, I, I won one of those, which, of course, it's billed as a sort of clone of the RCA 77. Mm. I, I took them and plugged them into uh, my Nagra 6. And uh, side by side, they sounded almost exactly identical, it's like just like a stereo pair, almost perfect. The one difference was the Heil put out 20 dB more than the RCA 77. Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, it's only what uh, yeah. 50 years newer, yeah. 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 better circuitry and whatnot. I, but, I, I like the Heil mics. I mean, there are a lot of people that have them in broadcast facilities, and for the price, I mean, they're pretty tasty. Mile handy one. Some one hundred, mm -hmm. and it's it was built in EQ for ham radio. I just wish he would have created a uh, a voice box microphone before he retired. But the, the Joe Walsh. Wow, wow. Didn't he make the original? He did. Yeah. Okay. So enough of bagging on that. So what's going to happen with? Um, Future applications using WebRTC? Who knows? I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, it's everything is turning into a service, whether it's software as a service or um, anything as a service, X as a service, platform as a service. Services are kind of like the next big thing, and WebRTC is kind of primed to kind of take up the mantle of um, broadcast communication um, in terms of services. I can tell you that this is our very first foray into providing a service, um, not just a piece of hardware. Well, actually, it's kind of a hybrid baby step into services. Um, we have something that's called Yaggle that we just introduced uh, last November, and it should be available um, for subscription any day now. Uh, it was supposed to be available end of 2021, but here we are, 2022, and I still don't have anything to sell. Hopefully soon. Um, the whole idea being that you log into this uh, Gaggle server, you create an account, and up to five people can take part in this conference. And as long as they have a decent headset or their smartphone or their PC, it's going to sound like they're in the studio. And you have internally conferenced audio here, and then the moderator will connect to one of our access or brick link codecs. And that's how you get it back to the studio. So 
the concept being that you've got contributors, New York, LA, Tokyo, London, you want them to be part of a conference altogether. Um, you don't have to send them a $4,000 piece of hardware or get them to download Zoom or Skype. You basically just send them a link, they click on it, it opens up a web browser, they plug in their headset, they give their device permission to use it, uh, the mic, and they're sitting at a conference with four other people and connected back to the studio. 35 bucks a month. Offline. It's like this. So you've got your four contributors here. They log into the interface. Um, one of them is going to be a moderator who then has the ability to connect to an access or a brick link back in the studio. And then you got your guy in the studio to be the moderator. Boom. Easy peasy. That's all the pitching I'm going to do on this one. So gotcha. I'm going to go ahead and start recording now so we can get some audio. Oh, just recording. so you can hear what it sounds like. Thank you. I have to say, you are sounding very good. Well, thank you very much. I, I'm a highly trained professional. <laughs> I was talking with technical quality. <laughs> but take the compliments anyway. <laughs> I was kidding. I know I suck. That's why I'm not yeah. a jock anymore. That's what's so good. Yeah. No, it sounds good. Sounds good. Actually, how's, how's, how's the weather there in Atlanta? Well, it was pretty crappy yesterday. So that just gives you an idea of, of what the audio quality is like. And it's kind of mind blowing that you're using a web browser. And he was in Scotland and I was in Atlanta and we were having a little conference back and forth. So imagine having multiple people. The great thing about Gaggle is the moderator has the ability to shut off people he doesn't want to hear from. So if you're doing like a sports roundup on a Friday night of high school sports scores, you'd have them all lined up and the moderator can select who's going to be on. Moderator can actually talk to the other people and without being heard over the air and say, okay, um, uh, Joe and Pacoima is going to be coming up next or uh, Cindy and wherever is going to be after that. So it's actually kind of a nice little interface. Pretty excited. Latency doesn't seem to be in there anymore. No, I mean, so it's like anything, it's all about last mile. So as long as you have a good last mile connection to your local um, provider, and as long as you don't have people downloading, you know, tons of videos or, or movies or uploading a bunch of stuff, I got stories. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a real quick. Uh, a broadcast engineer who is not to be named, who I think I'm good friends with now, um, totally trashed Comrex on a, a list somewhere. Said that he had just bought $8,000 worth of stuff and he could just flush it down the toilet because it never works when he needs it to. So I jumped on a plane and went out to his facility across the country, showed up at his doorstep, and he was amazed. I said, show me what's going on here. And he goes, there shouldn't be a problem. I have a 15 meg Metro Ethernet. And I went, dedicated to the access, right? He goes, no, no, for the building. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Um, okay. So let me guess, at about five o'clock in the afternoon, when you're out doing a remote, it stops working, right? He goes, yeah, how did you know? I said, is that when traffic is uploading traffic logs? We're downloading stuff from corporate goes, okay. So did you do any prioritization for the device? How about if you get a separate $40 a month internet connection just for the device, see if that fixes it. And it did. So I saved his $8,000 just because. Anyway, I got all kinds of stories like that. Moving on. Oh, oh, let's go back. Can we go back? Becky knows what I'm talking about. Nope. <laughs> so um, 5G, we're getting asked a lot about 5G. Everybody keeps on saying, hey, is Comrex 5G ready? And my response has always been, well, 5G isn't even 5G ready. So why are you asking me if we're 5G ready? Um, I, I get a little bit salty on that because... There are a lot of things happening in the world of telecommunications that you may or may not be aware of. 3G is actually being shut off by AT&T. Um, I also have been getting reports that 4G services have been dialed down in terms of throughput and speed in favor of 5G services, um, even though there's limited availability. But even in my neighborhood in Buford, Georgia, I'm seeing little garbage cans on telephone poles. Um, which indicates that there is 5G service that is starting to appear. Um, the thing that's maddening to me about 5G is it's not even fully specified for mobile. mobile. It's not 
do to be fully specified by the World Wide Web Consortium until, or no, the 3G Global Partnership until 2024. That's when part 17 gets released and you'll start to see more deployment and faster data speeds and more of this 1,000% um, improvement in speed over 4G and 99% availability. Now it's pretty sucky. Um, I know that because I have a, 4, a 5G modem from AT&T and it has yet to light up for 5G. Maybe some mobile phones, but even their own, their own modems that they're selling kind of lit up 5G. Maybe it will now, I've turned it on for a week or two. But that being said, is Commerce 5G ready? Yes, we're 5G ready. Uh, we have a couple of modems that we have actually um, included the drivers for, this being one of them. This is AT&T's version. That's Verizon's version. And you can actually tether it to a Comrex IP audio codec or a video codec. And if you have 5G, it will magically work. You got 5G on your phone? Sweet. But it's Verizon. I'm just going to turn it up. And the speed varies highly from 10 megs to 300, depending on where you are. You know, I'm not even used this in the battery state, so that's got to tell you something. Oops. <laughs> so anyway, um, we do have 5G capability, um, but 5G, in my mind, will be a real thing for a, a, another year or two. Uh, you know, if you want to have realistic expectations of using it on a broadcast. I go back a few years to when we um, started using our IP audio codec on 3G. And it was supposed to be like the greatest thing ever. You can broadcast from anywhere. Well, it was for about two and a half weeks until everybody started getting on their phones and then it killed 3G. 4G was great because they increased capacity by a huge amount. And they basically got that out there pretty fast and curious. So 4G, once we had 4G and once they actually deployed the full standard, 4G was great. But we're kind of in that weird, uncomfortable zone between 4G and 5G um, and T-Mobile is probably the best situated for reliable 4G because they bought all that 600 megahertz spectrum. And so they're shoving all their, their 5G data stuff down on 600 megahertz, which gives you a lot of signal um, propagation and um, you know, you're not dealing with having to worry about trees and people and dogs and things that are impeding the signal. Um, some of the Millimeter wave stuff, it's kind of ridiculous because a blowing tree can interrupt your signal. And a lot of times, especially if you're looking for a Verizon 5G hotspot, you stand here, it's good. Go over here, it goes away. If you get on a bus, forget about it. So we'll see. I mean, 5G is going to be good eventually. Yeah, have you got any update on the airports that was complaining about? They don't want the 5G. I think a lot of that was um, politically motivated. Um, you know, you, you might remember back, I remember getting on a, a U.S. Airways plane. Why I would ever do that? <laughs> I got on a U.S. Airways flight and I had my phone, I had data on it, and the flight attendant came up and she said, You can't use that. I said, Well, Flight mode is off. I'm just using the calculator. Well, you can't use it. I said, why not? She said, I have a document that says those phones are interfering with fly-by wire. The radio is off. But you can't explain that to a flight attendant who has a, a six-year out-of-date document. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So 5G, fun stuff. It's going to be great eventually. So that's all I have to talk about. I have Answers to questions. I have opinions on stuff to tell. Um, I'd be happy to entertain anything you might ask. Yes, sir. You said every all these different browsers is already in. I have I use Firefox, but uh, how do I know if it's there? Firefox updates about 
if it's updated, it's got Firefox and Chrome and Safari and Edge had it for at least two years now. So if you have the most updated version, WebRTC is in there. You can actually go into settings and probably find some WebRTC settings. In but it's really kind of deep into the browser. It's up to the app to grab a hold of it. You have to have a uh, API, application programming interface, um, and JavaScript to wake it up. So it's in there, I can guarantee it. So a lot of us have been around the business a long time. Uh, think about where we've gone, the lead of father and <laughs> I, I see some of the stuff that people are using on here now, uh, you know, and a lot of it has to do with the pandemic and nobody is traveling any thing in here. But uh, there's barbecue, how could I not? Yeah, I mean, really. And this is some of the best. Anyway, um, uh, unfortunately, the broadcast business, I think, has become accustomed to whatever you could get over Skype or, or, or Zoom or whoever with somebody, you know, sitting in their living room or in, in front of their business or something, you know, talking on their cell phone. And I, I just shudder to think that I'm, that I'm afraid, I guess, that that ship is sailed and we're stuck with it and it's never gonna recover unless there's a better technological solution, solution that is gonna make up for the crap. But, you know, I, I, I go back to a meeting I had years and years ago when I was at the ABS Weekly here and we were talking and the general manager came out and sat there in the connection to me and told us about it. And, uh, you know, we all kind of stopped at the time, but of course, the prediction came true uh, that, you know, in, in someday we would be using, uh, you know, cameras that were a few hundred dollars instead of 75,000 that we carried on our shoulders. And, uh, uh, I mean, yes, we are, but I won't say that, you know, we're an equivalent quality or even better sound quality but i mean I, like i said i'm just i just expect that that ship has sailed and you know we're never going to go back now or never going to be able to pick that back up well the thing that i have to do in my job is explain to programmers that people have higher expectations in terms of the content that they're getting because there are podcasts that sound really good yeah. Because people are buying a six hundred dollar Roadcaster Pro, and it's got Apex, you know, stuff built into it. It's got a decent mic pre. Is it the most brilliant thing? Is it a benchmark mic pre? No. Um, it still sounds really good, and you can upload that, and the quality is good. I don't think that. Well, maybe I'm an exception to the rule, but I doubt it. People calling in on a crappy cell phone um, that is unintelligible, trying to listen to a football game for three hours. It's fatiguing, it's, um, it's tinny, and it's unlistenable. I think a lot of people get tired of, of well, there is such thing as listener fatigue, we know that. Uh, it's compounded by things like pseudo-noise encoding that you have on uh, uh, cell phones, because they're cramming a lot of voice channels onto a single um, channel on their, on their uh, network. And it's really hard to listen to. Um, that's why wideband voice, MR wideband, EBS, all these algorithms that are on here are designed to make it sound better. And part of the voice over LTE specification allows for G.722 and AMR and narrowband to happen between AT&T and Verizon, Verizon and T-Mobile and all these others. It's part of the voice over LTE spec. So at least there are some forward thinking people in cell phone companies that think, boy, we can actually make these sound good between callers. My frustration is we can't make them sound good between the cell phone user and the broadcast users. And I wish I could find the person in cell phone companies that would basically open it up to allow us to put this in a broadcast facing interface so we can make telephone calls sound more intelligent. In the meantime, we have tools like WebRTC that will allow us to do that. And we're starting to hear that. I mean, if you 
listen to any of the coverage from Ukraine, people are using wideband voice technologies to actually be intelligent. You know, I'm listening to the BBC almost regularly, listening to reports from Ukraine, and people are using WhatsApp that has its WebRTC. So they're using that for voice, and it sounds great. You know, most of those look pretty darn good. I mean, there's no satellite traffic all over the place. Right. So, yeah, you're right. Maybe the technology is the rest of us. I can only hope because, I mean, for the longest time, for the past 10 years, it's made it worse, especially for radio side. Yes. Um, and if you think about, you know, on the video side, this is a $3 camera, but it supports HDR yeah. and, and really high data rates. It does. 1080p or whatever. So these are pretty amazing. Um, but is it a broadcast interface? Not really. But it's, it's good enough. But I guess it just it just depends on what you can convince the programmers and the being cameras. Can I just a comment? Oh, okay. <clears throat> The, the term 5G is banded around quite a bit in that it sometimes doesn't have an application. Like uh, I saw an article about 5G in automotive control inside the car. It just meant fifth generation. It didn't really have anything to do with telecommunications per se. Well, you know, like for television, 3G, that's always been kind of frustrating to me as a non-video guy because 3G video is different than 3G cellular. So that's been a confusion. But Here's another one for you. HD for yeah. radio. It means nothing. It doesn't mean high definition. It doesn't mean anything. It's just down. Um, so 5G isn't even 5G, as I mentioned. And everybody jumped on the, the bandwagon and saying we're the first 5G. Well, kind of. Are we going to see 5G light? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're seeing right now. It's okay. 5G. Everything is 5G. 5G R. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the, video, the video has 4K, 8K. Oh, there's 10K also. I saw that. Mm -hmm. I heard one guy say he had a test. He had within two blocks of the tower. That's it. And he said two blocks away. And, you know, there's different kinds of 5G as well, because there's fixed 5G that is fully specified. And that's being used um, for uh, places that don't have uh, infrastructure to be able to pull fiber, but you can get a little uh, shark fin modem and you can get fixed 5G that's in one place. It's not mobile, but that was fully specified at the end of 2017. And it's being used by cruise ship companies and municipalities and stuff. Uh, it's the mobile 5G, which is still a work in progress because there's so much stuff that they've got to pour into it and it's still being developed. Um, there's still technologies being developed. I mean, it, there are so many acronyms involved with it, like um, uh, FDN, and, um, software defined radios, and that, 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 that goes on and on and on. Um, and they're still working on, I think, um, e SIMs as opposed to regular SIM cards. Um, which are built into silicon and certain chips. So it's if you ever are bored, go to 3gpp.org and you can go through the specifications for 5G. And, oh my God, that's crazy. Um, a lot of the stuff that's being released right now is actually enterprise stuff for factories. And, uh, and it's not even been pushed out to these devices. So even though they light up with a 5G thing, it's not truly. 5G. That's my wife's new Apple phone who had an eSIM, but she was allowed to use her SIM card. And I wanted to know the difference. I mean, why, why one over the other? And they weren't able to really, really say anything about it. It's because it hasn't been defined. And they, it's not in their book or script. They take a script for that. Most erudite people that are on the other end of the phone at the rise of this conspiracy. <laughs> Well, Chris, thank you very much. Absolutely. Oh, besides, I had to fill out my uh, minimums uh, uh, passport.
So I've been working on that. <laughs>